Hello, this is Bethany Bowman from Professional Educators of Tennessee. I'm delighted today to have Stan Breeden, who is the Assistant Superintendent of Operations for Murray County Public Schools in Tennessee. He's going to do a webinar for us on the operation and maintenance of K-12 school facilities, something that's very important if you're a principal or a superintendent. And if you're not familiar with this, I think that you'll find this webinar very informative. Overseeing the operation of their school facility is a normal function of the school administrator's role. It includes keeping the building in a clean, healthy, and pleasant condition. Typically, the school district will assign resources for custodial care and upkeep, which the administrator must supervise or utilize along with a means to request maintenance and repairs through appropriate channels. So today we're gonna to look at what it means uh, to operate and maintain a facility. The International Facilities Management Association defines facilities operations as assuring that the facility infrastructure and how it is used and managed provides a satisfactory work environment, is in compliance with laws and regulations, and meets financial performance goals reflects efficient utility services and costs and protects the surrounding community and environment. They define facilities maintenance as assuring that all the elements of the infrastructure are serviced so they operate efficiently and are reliable and safe. It includes scheduling and conducting regular, periodic, predictive, preventative, and corrective maintenance activities. The um, Association of School Business Officials International, along with the National Center for Education Statistics, commissioned a task force in 2003, which released a planning guide for maintaining school facilities. Most of their uh, findings are still very applicable to today's buildings and uh, that's a good source of information for school districts as they plan to take care of school facilities. One of the things they noted was that facilities problems affect teaching and learning student and staff health, day-to-day -day building operations, and the long-range fiscal health of the entire organization. To some people's surprise, Facility problems are less a function of geography or socioeconomics and more directly related to staff levels, training, and practices, all of which can be controlled by the organization. Thus, every school district should plan to meet the challenge of effective school uh, facilities maintenance. It is simply too big and too important of a job to address haphazardly. And so what I want to do today is give you some information that deals with those kind of things. Um, an effective school maintenance and operation strategy will contain many elements. While uh, the administrator and educators only play a part of this strategy, having a good understanding of these elements will increase the likelihood that school facilities will be adequately uh, and effectively maintain a way that they serve as a proper learning environment for the students in that school. There are several factors which you can see here on this chart that come into play when you're looking at the operations and maintenance of facility. Of course, we want our facilities to be comfortable. We want them to be clean. We want them to last for a long time. We want them to be cost effective. We want them to be orderly. We want them to be instructionally supportive. We want them to be technology equipped, and very importantly, we want them to be safe and secure. And so in order to meet all of these objectives, there's really eight areas that we can look at that help keep our facilities uh, prepared for this. The first one of those is safety and security, and, and we're going to elaborate on each of these in just a few minutes. But all along with that, we're talking about janitorial care. Scheduling of facilities is an important area as well. Corrective maintenance is important for facilities. Preventative maintenance, capital maintenance, 
sometimes in facilities we're dealing with renovations or total replacements and of course we also do new facilities and additions. While administrators and educators shouldn't be experts on facilities, an overview of these eight topics will be helpful in the understanding needed to increase the effectiveness of school facilities for those individuals. So the first area that we want to look at is safety and security. It may be the most important area when we're looking at um, the needs of a facility. Uh, unfortunately, today's environment has put even more focus on this, and it is something that each school district, each school spends a lot of time planning for. And every school starts by doing that with an emergency plan. Uh, it's required. Uh, state of Tennessee, where we operate, it's required that every school have an emergency plan. There's a lot of things that you will find in that plan. It will include things like call lists, a relocation plan, command structure, drill schedule, team assignments, threat assessments. There are a lot of parts that go into making up that plan and identifying the individuals who are supposed to carry out every section of that plan. But there's more when you talk about safety and security. There's also not only emergency plan, there's what we refer to as a life safety plan. Life safety deals with those kind of things that deal with things like fire or uh, events that happen because of weather or natural disasters. We do drills for those, fire drills. Um, again, uh, in our state, every school is required to do one of these monthly. It also identifies exit plans that you have to get out of the building. Egress from the building is an important part of a life safety plan. And of course, that's an important part of, of the fire safety. But also, in addition to life safety, when we're looking at a facility, we look at the security of the facility. Now, sometimes those are very different things when you're talking about life safety, when you're talking about security, because security and life safety sometimes can even conflict with the with the things that you do to prepare a building for that. But when we're talking about security uh, in a facility, some of the physical things that we're doing to, to take care of security in a building is visitor management, access control, uh, security cameras, uh, incident drills that are done to deal with that. But a lot of things are done from the facility point of view that can impact the security of that facility. And another thing that plays an important part of safety and security facility is the signage. Uh, being able to find where to go. We mentioned before those, uh, those exit plans, which of course are posted throughout buildings when it comes to life safety, being able to find where things are. That's a very important part of the safety and security of the building. Another area that we want to look at is janitorial care. Obviously, um, there's a lot of things that go into it, and janitorial care can be one of the most people resource intensive part of caring for facilities. Uh, some school districts have chosen to outsource this. Some of them handle it in-house. But whichever way that is handled, whether it's outsourced or whether it's handled in-house, it is an important role for the administrator of the ability, building to be involved in janitorial care. How it's handled can impact the amount of time that the administrator has to spend, whether they're actually supervising or they're actually contacting in the case of sometimes of where it's outsourced. But it is important that not only the administrator, but all the staff are focused on uh, janitorial care and being able to point out when uh, things are not being handled adequately or being able to notice when they are. But of course, janitorial care can involve things like trash removal, the paper goods that are provided, the cleaning, uh, solutions that are provided. There's different ways that buildings can be cleaned. One of the ways is team cleaning, where you use a team to uh, clean the entire building. Some, might, some may be assigned to uh, empty the trash. Another member of the team may be assigned to clean restrooms. Another member of the team may be assigned to do the floors. Um, another way that it's done sometimes is zone cleaning, where one member of the team is given an entire zone, maybe a wing of the building, a classroom wing, and they're responsible for cleaning everything in that wing from, from emptying the trash, uh, from cleaning the restrooms, for caring for the floors, all the different parts that go into it. Of course, sometimes uh, we're getting involved in green cleaning, which is used environmentally friendly uh, substances to clean with, and that can, can add a whole different aspect to cleaning as well. And again, it's important 
whenever you're defining janitorial care that you define cleaning standards. There needs to be a standard set and the expectation level from everybody who's using the facility needs to uh, meet those cleaning standards and understand those cleaning standards. One of the ways, the best way to uh, set cleaning standards is to utilize an organization called APPA, A-P-P-A. APPA is, uh, defines themselves as leadership and educational facilities. They're involved in both the K-12 uh, facility area as long with college and university facilities. They have developed a matrix that kind of identifies expectation levels and so they've set level one, level two, level three, level four that you can see here on the screen. Um, uh, starting at level one would be the highest level of care and obviously down to level five, which would be an area where care was primarily neglected. These levels are determined by the amount of resources and time that you put in. So as, as you can imagine, with, when you're talking about resources, what you're talking about is you're talking about cost. And so most school districts, K-12 school districts, operate within the two to three level on the APA scale. Most of them are not able to put the resources into custodial care to reach a level one. And, and quite honestly, that's probably not most of their goal, but most of them are able to reach a two to a three APA level with their custodial care. Now, many post-secondary uh, schools, colleges and universities, some commercial buildings try to get up into the one to the two level. But again, it's a matter of resources, it's a matter of cost, but it's important that this care level is communicated so that the expectations of the people inhabiting the building match the care level that's trying to be achieved in the building. Because again, they can uh, let you know that, uh, that whether or not that's being met. Obviously, you know, one example might be in a level one facility, um, uh, where you're having level one care, you might be mopping floors every day, but that may not be happening at a two to three level. Might be sweeping the floors every day, but may not be mopping the floors every day. So that gives you an example of, of expectation, expectation levels and the level of care that is being, um, that the goal is to achieve for that facility. Another area uh, has to do with scheduling. Really important when you're um, looking at managing a facility. Sometimes it's overlooked, but especially when you have use by internal and external groups, it's really important that there's some effective method of scheduling that. Also, uh, most of our school buildings now are using some sort of building automation system to improve efficiency and save costs, but it's dependent on a well-managed facility schedule to make sure that that building automation system is being uh, implemented as, as uh, effectively as possible to th adjust things like the heat and, and the air in that building. It's also important to schedule both internal and external use. Uh, sometimes schools focus on groups that are coming from the outside and making sure they're on the schedule, but they often overlook scheduling things that are going on during the school day. And so there can be conflict if if two groups think they're going to be using the gym at the same time, for instance, and that hasn't been scheduled properly. Uh, standard procedures on scheduling buildings can eliminate confusion and disagreement. One of the things that uh, is good about allowing outside groups to use facilities, and most uh, school facilities do have outside groups who come in and use those, is they can improve relationships with local organizations. Also, they can help generate funds to recoup operating costs because most school districts, when an outside group comes in, they will be, there will be a charge for the use of the facility. And scheduling facilities can most effectively be achieved with an automated and systematic approach. A lot of school districts have gone to an automated system for scheduling facilities, and that can be uh, very helpful when you're looking at this area. Uh, the next item that we wanted to talk about, uh, one that probably um, from an administrator, an educator, or an educator role you don't think about very much is corrective maintenance. 
uh, or I'm sorry, it is one that you think about. I'm, I was thinking about preventative maintenance, but corrective maintenance is one that is probably thought about a lot from the administrator role because this is when something breaks in the building. It's an unplanned uh, maintenance, uh, something that happens that has to be repaired. Those repairs sometimes are emergency repairs. You know, uh, an example of emergency repair would be a broken pipe that's flooding the building or a gas leak. Uh, that's that's happened. Those those would be considered an emergency situation. Most of the repairs that happen under corrective maintenance are not emergency repairs. A light bulb's gone out. Um, you know, maybe a uh, a faucet is dripping in a restroom. Uh, all kinds of things like that can be considered non-emergency repairs. A lot of times you're dealing with a replacement issue, replacement of light bulbs. Uh, you're dealing with replacement of ballasts in lights. Um, you're talking about broken fixtures or things like that and be repaired. One of the things that's changing this uh, corrective maintenance area for a lot of school districts is moving to uh, changing their lighting to LED fixtures. A lot of schools have been going through those upgrades because of the efficiency of those fixtures when it comes from a uh, energy utilization. Uh, there's a very a quick turnaround on the cost payback on that. But what that brings with it is LED fixtures last a lot longer than the fluorescent or incandescent fixtures that we've used in the past. Also, most of those fixtures are not ballasted fixtures. Some are, but most are not ballasted fixtures. And so you don't have a ballast to replace. So there's not near the light bulb change or the light ballast change that we saw with fluorescent fixtures or with incandescent fixtures. So that is, uh, that is helping in the area of corrective maintenance. Of course, there's also code issues that we have to deal with and codes change and we have regular inspections on things that are code issues. Um, re uh, all schools are inspected by the state fire marshal's office and they um, enforce codes. Also local jurisdictions, uh, fire marshals can uh, also do inspections. And so sometimes they will identify a code violation in the school when they're doing that inspection and that will cause a corrective maintenance issue. Mentioned already, you can have things like leaks and floods, uh, roof leaks, uh, you can have pipes burst. Their spills can be a corrective maintenance problem. The management and disposal of hazardous waste, electronic waste and environmental hazards can be considered a corrective maintenance issue. And we're gonna talk more about those a little later on. And typically, there will be a maintenance request system where you report corrective maintenance needs. It's real important in managing facility that there's a systematic way to report corrective maintenance needs so that you can, uh, you can go and enter those through a maintenance request system. But the other kind of maintenance needs, the one I was jumped ahead and was thinking about earlier, are preventive maintenance needs. Preventive maintenance needs are planned. Again, these are ones that sometimes the administrator or the educator is not involved in because this is actually coming in and doing service on a regular basement, a regular basis um, to equipment. And it's very important to maintain a, a building, a facility that you do preventative maintenance, but sometimes it's neglected and sometimes it's eliminated. Sometimes uh, schools, facilities and school districts have chosen to operate on fix on failure kind of approach. We don't fix something unless it breaks, but um, that can in the long run be a very expensive way to operate a building and also can cause for a lot of problems. It's more effective if there is preventative maintenance being done on a regularly scheduled basis. And one of the things that immediately people think about when you think about preventative maintenance are things like filter replacements. All of the HVAC equipment in the in the facility have filters which have to be replaced. And that's an example of preventative maintenance. There's also plumbing. Some of the plumbing uh, fixtures have filters that have to be replaced. Uh, there's inspections that need to be done just to look at equipment to make sure that it's properly operating. Things can be determined if, if equipment is inspected on a regular basis. Painting would be considered a preventative maintenance. In our school district, we have a schedule in which we repaint facilities Ours are actually on a seven year schedule so that we have a rotation and every facility is scheduled to be repainted every seven years. Uh, also a part of preventive maintenance is making adjustments. A lot of the equipment has to be adjusted. There are things that need to be tightened. There's belts that need to be checked. 
all sorts of things that need to be done through a preventative schedule. And those are best, most effectively handled if they're scheduled through a maintenance system as well. Um, sometimes a uh, school district will use, and, and I know what we use, we use the same maintenance request system to generate preventative maintenance work orders as we do corrective maintenance work orders. And those are scheduled and come out on a regular basis. Another area um, that is important in the building um, is, is to look at all the different systems that make up the building because each one of those systems has special maintenance, both corrective and maintenance needs. And so the first one of those, going back to what we talked about earlier was with uh, safety and security, is to look at the fire suppression and life safety equipment. There's quite a bit of fire suppression and life safety equipment within a school facility that must be monitored and maintained. The first one of those is fire alarms and the monitoring system that, that uh, monitors those alarms. Um, there'll be a, a call system where uh, that is monitored through. In addition to that, you have fire extinguishers, you have sprinkler systems, you have fire doors and fire shutters, and then there's plans of egress. The first of these that we, we list here, fire alarms, fire extinguishers, sprinkler systems, fire doors and shutters are required to be inspected on an annual basis. Um, actually, fire doors and fire shutters in Tennessee is not something that we've had to have a, have a fire, uh, an annual inspection on, but we were notified by the state fire marshal's office over this last year that they're going to be including those, those inspections as well in 2019. And those annual inspections, which were required, must be on file within the school. They are subject to be examined when the fire marshal does their annual inspection of the building. So administrators should know where their inspections for their fire alarms, their fire extinguishers, their sprinkler systems, and their fire doors and shutters are stored within the school because the fire marshal is going to ask for those. Now, on the, the fire extinguishers, and sometimes on the sprinkler systems, there's actually a tag that shows when it was inspected. But if there are any reports that go along with these, these should be on file in the school office and available when the fire marshal comes to make their, their annual inspection. Of course, with egress, which is the last one of these, they're supposed to be marked and identified. And of course, there will be times that the fire marshal will come in and look at, is something blocking an egress? It's why you can't have things stored in hallways. Uh, for example, that would prevent the flow in case of a fire, people being able to exit from the building. Uh, the other part of school safety and security is the uh, equipment in the building that makes up the system for the security part of the building. We mentioned before, you have security alarms and those security alarms are monitored. You can have access controls or locks, whether those locks are electronic locks or where they're mechanical locks. They're a part of the control of getting in and out of the building. Most schools have gone to some sort of access control, uh, at least on ex the external doors in a building. And most schools now stay locked all of the time. Even the front door for most schools are locked and there's some kind of access system, a call station at the front door where visitors to the school have to call in and are allowed access into the building. All of these are a maintenance issue. They have to be maintained. There are security cameras. Uh, security cameras have a ways to be monitored. There's also recording. Uh, these are important part of the security uh, function of a building. The intercom or public address system of building is a very important part of building security. Uh, and then some schools have installed panic buttons, a button which actually can be pressed in the case of emergency, which will immediately summon um, uh, the emergency response, either police or fire in case of an emergency. More and more emphasis is being placed on building security. In 2018, in Tennessee, the, uh, there was a $35 million grant, $35 million grant that the governor put in place where schools are getting money to upgrade the physical security of their buildings because of all the emphasis that's been placed on issues. Uh, along that impact building security. Another building system 
probably the one that requires the most maintenance in most buildings is the HVAC system, the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning system of that building. Uh, those are a very important part of making sure that the building is comfortable and that it, it is either it's warm when it's supposed to be warm, it's cool when it's supposed to be cool, and that there's enough fresh air to serve the building. And so there's a lot of different equipment that goes in a building to make up the HVAC system. And as I said, it's probably the most maintenance intensive part of any building. When it comes to heating, all kinds of different equipment is used to accomplish heating a building. There are things like boilers, furnaces, heat pumps, unit ventilators, radiators are some of the terms that you'll use for heating the equipments there. For cooling, there are chillers, condensing units, cooling towers, package units, split systems, uh, a relatively new over the last several years system that's going into heat and cool buildings and something called variable refrigerant flow, the VRS system, which is uh, a lot of uh, facilities are starting to move toward. Fresh air is an important part. When you put as many people into a building as we do, there are requirements for fresh air to be introduced in the building to make sure that carbon uh, monoxide levels and carbon dioxide levels stay at the appropriate, appropriate amount. Um, this is accomplished through units that actually bring in fresh air. Those units are things like makeup air units, which are so normally referred to uh, MAUs, DOAS units, dedicated outstair units, or ERV units, energy recovery ventilator, all have to do with introducing fresh air into the build, building. And then often uh, with the HVAC, you not only have the unit that supplies, but you also have some way to distribute the heat, the cool, the fresh air within the building. A lot of HVA systems are water source systems, meaning that you have water pipes that run through the building to deliver hot or cold uh, water uh, to help deal with that. So you have hydronic piping and, and pumps to do with that. Sometimes you'll have ducts, plenums, and chases which flow air throughout the building. They're air handling units. They're outside air vents to let the outside air in. There's exhaust vents and fans to pull air out of the building or circulate air through the building. And of course, you have building automation systems which control all of this to automatically turn the thermostats up or turn the thermostats down. Schedules are set so that, that heat and air is turned either up or down during the unoccupied times of the building to increase the efficiency of the building. And building automation systems can not only control control the HVAC, but also can control the lighting in the building. The next system that we want to look at is the electrical system. Again, a major part of a building and also uh, an area of the building has to be maintained. Uh, one of the things that uh, the people who occupy a building, especially the administrators of the building, need to be aware of is the electrical systems in your building are more sophisticated than what's in your home. Uh, the commercial electrical system is very different in ways than the residential due to a much higher voltage that's going through there. Uh, there can be danger, but they can be a much more dangerous system. And so you want to make sure if there's any issues with the electrical system in your building, you always let your maintenance department handle those. Uh, when you get into the large switch gear that you can find in your electrical closets, uh, the breakers there are like the breakers that you have in your breaker box at home. Uh, there's something called the arc flash that can occur when you're dealing with these high voltage breakers, which is very, very dangerous and should be left up to the professionals. Um, you can see some of the, the parts of the electrical system which are listed here, lights, are considered to be a part of the electrical system. Service entrance and switch gear, transformers, wiring, outlets, panel boards, circuit breakers, switches, motors are, are part. And there's a lot of motors that are used within a commercial building, a commercial electrical system. Communication and security systems, emergency and standby power sources. And some of this is what's considered to be low voltage systems. Some are the higher voltage systems, but they all are important part of the, the electrical system of the building. The plumbing system, 
is another obviously important part of the building system. Uh, again, improperly mo monitored and maintained plumbing systems can equal high costs. We have to pay for water. And so uh, an, uh, a plumbing system that's not properly maintained can cause uh, a high cost if that water's leaking somewhere. Also, the plumbing system would include the gas system because gas goes through the plumbing pipes. And of course, if you've got a maintenance issue or a problem with your gas system, uh, that can be a substantial safety issue as well. So again, the parts of the plumbing system uh, can be things like water and, and gas plumbing, water fountains, restroom fixtures, kitchen sinks, dishwashers, ice machines, water heaters, sanitary sewer is what we consider when we're talking about wastewater. The storm sewer part of, of your plumbing system is for runoff water obviously what runs off the roof of your parking area. Uh, some uh, school facilities, you'll have irrigation systems for either the lawns or the athletic fields. There's a fire sprinkler system in many buildings, though not all buildings are required. It depends on when the building was built. Fire, I don't, didn't record the exact date, but it's somewhere around the late 80s, early 90s, when buildings were required to have fire sprinkler systems in them. So buildings built before that uh, possibly do not have a fire sprinkler system in them. And then of course the HVAC hydronic systems we mentioned before have pipes running through the building that water is carried through to the HVAC systems. But again, these are important maintenance issues. <coughs> the roof system is an important building system as well and there's all kinds of roofs that are in place on school facilities some of those are pitched roofs typically pitched roofs will be covered by metal or shingles there's other materials that can be used as well these are the primary ones we see uh, some roofs are low slope roofs sometimes referred to a flat roof though there's really not any such thing as a true flat roof on most facilities all of them have some sort of slope or pitch to them. Uh, flat roofs are typically covered uh, by some sort of membrane, um, uh, types of membranes that you might hear about, EPDM, PVC, CPE, TPO. They're, they're, uh, typically, they'll be an adhered membrane or a mechanically fastened membrane. You also sometimes will have ballasted roof systems where you actually have a ballast on top of, of the roofing material. Uh, sometimes there's green roof systems. Actually, people are, are actually have things growing on roofs that are part of the ballasting system of the roof. And of course, with a roof, you've got to have gutters or drains to remove the water uh, when it's raining from the roof. Another part, uh, the roof's part of the building envelope. And another part that we consider when we're looking at the building envelope are windows and doors. You don't think much about windows and doors, but they're an important part of a building system. And uh, obviously there's maintenance and repairs. Uh, they have to be functioning properly. Uh, windows and doors serve lots of purposes, uh, one of which is egress coming and going in the building, but also their security feature and the uh, windows can be uh, allowing light into the building, but also allowing in a way that you don't get too much glare, too much tea from that. Um, there are all kinds of, of um, materials that are used for windows and doors. Typically with doors, you'll hear things, uh, terms like doors that are wood, doors that are hollow metal, doors that are aluminum storefront. You're used to talk about an interior door, an exterior door, and then obviously all your doors and your windows have generally, no, not all windows are operable, but if they're operable, windows and then obviously if they're operable doors they will have some sort of, of uh, device that you close that there'll be some hardware on it which will be which will allow those to open and close with um, maintaining all of these building systems there is also a level of maintenance that can be achieved again we turn to APA to look at a matrix that shows us levels of maintenance that we try to achieve. You can see here uh, from level one, which could be referred to as a showpiece facility, always down to level five, the crisis response, just like we saw with cleaning. There are different levels 
that we're trying to achieve in maintenance. Again, most school districts, because of resources, operate somewhere in the two to three level uh, on the maintenance ma matrix. There are some though, as I mentioned before, who even operate down in the four or five, more of a reactive or crisis kind of maintenance when they wait and just fix stuff when it breaks. But this gives a good idea of what kind of maintenance level. And again, the occupants of a building should know what the school district has set as their goal for a maintenance level so that they can match the expectations to that. Another kind of maintenance is what we normally refer to as capital maintenance. And capital maintenance usually is dealing with replacing the larger pieces of equipment or systems in a building. For instance, a roof replacement would be considered capital maintenance because of the large cost that is involved with that. The replacement of an HVAC system, the replacement of a plumbing system uh, would be considered to be capital maintenance. And capital maintenance is really important to consider when you're considering the total cost of ownership of a building. Uh, sometimes um, school districts only focus on the upfront cost when building a new, a new building uh, or look at when maintaining a building, but really the long-term cost of that building should be considered uh, what's referred to as the total cost of ownership. So capital maintenance should be planned, but often again, districts operate on a run to failure approach due to lack of funds. And so sometimes capital maintenance is not planned. It's just dealt with on an emergency basis. It would include the replacement of equipment or systems. It deals with major repairs. There needs to be some method in place for the school district for forecasting this. Normally we refer to capital forecasts and capital budget planning. Again, um, in the K-12 environment for many districts, we operate with such a, you know, such tight funds, capital budget planning cannot always happen uh, as effectively as it needs to and sometimes even is overlooked, but it is an important part of operating a facility. A good way to help with capital forecasting and capital budget planning is to have a facilities condition assessment completed for your facilities. Normally, that is done by bringing in a third party to examine your buildings. Uh, these are done by engineers or architects. They actually will look at the building, determine the life of the equipment or the system in the building, put together a schedule of when that will typically need to be replaced based on the life cycle of that equipment. Uh, they can give you projected costs of what that might be. They can identify if there are there's equipment uh, in your building that is past its life cycle, normally what's called deferred maintenance. Unfortunately, many uh, school districts and school facilities have to deal with a lot of deferred maintenance issues, maintenance that should have been done in the past, but it's been deferred because there's not sufficient funds to deal with that. So a facilities condition assessment can help provide that information, which can be very uh, very important in helping doing the capital forecasting and capital planning that a school district should do. Uh, along with that, the facilities condition assessment will help you develop a facilities condition index for your building. A facilities condition index basically takes the existing major repair costs and replacement deficiencies and divides that by the current property replacement value. So it helps determine whether or not a repair is more cost effective on that building or it needs to be replaced. Typically, most uh, professionals will recommend a 50% on a facilities condition index. So basically, if, if the uh, major repairs costs and replacement deficiencies, if it's 50% of the property replacement value for that building, uh, a lot of professionals will recommend that building, you're, it's more cost effective to replace it than to try to repair it. And again, having a facilities condition assessment to help you determine a facilities condition index for that facility is very helpful for those planning needs. And so as we talk about that, we kind of move on to the next area of dealing with facilities. And that's sometimes when we're dealing with new facilities, 
replacements of existing facilities or additions to existing facilities. Again, that can be determined, that need is determined based on the condition of the existing facility. Sometimes it has to be replaced, retired and replaced. Buildings ha have a life to them. Uh, depends on how they were built, the materials that were used when they were built. It depends on how they've been maintained on what that life could be. Uh, so, uh, sometimes the buildings last 100 years. Sometimes they last 50 years. Some buildings can be built in a way that only last 25 years. But uh, again, the facilities condition assessment can help determine that. Sometimes uh, that need is based on growth. We are fortunate in the area that we live in, I guess fortunate would be the right word, but we actually live in an area where we're growing. And because of that, we're having to add additional schools to our school district because of growth. In order to, do, to deal with new facility replacements, new facilities or replacements or additions, obviously there's a lot of planning that has to go into that process. Uh, it needs to involve stakeholder input. They're very, a uh, stakeholder input is critical to planning for new facilities, replacements and additions. Obviously you have to have funding and that involves the, the funding body, uh, depending on school district of Tennessee. Uh, uh, if you're a, a public school district, typically uh, that goes to, uh, if we're a school district like us, the county commission. Uh, who has to provide that funding. Uh, in Tennessee, school districts do not uh, have the ability to raise their own funds to a public school district. Uh, there's a lot of delivery methods that can be used uh, to provide for a new building. Uh, and this can impact the process and the cost. But some of those that you will he hear of and probably one of the most traditional methods that's been, been used the most is what's called the design bid build. You hire an architect to design the building, you put it out for bids, you select a contractor from those bids to build the building. Another process is what's called design build, uh, where you actually involve the contractor and the architect together in the process. Sometimes uh, you utilize a construction manager to oversee that process and then another form of that where you're, you're kind of putting together the design build and construction manager is what's called construction manager at risk. Typically under the design build and the construction manager at risk process, the building will be built use, using what's called a guaranteed maximum price. And so instead of actually uh, going to a public bid process, the construction manager or uh, will actually go through the bid process for you and deliver back under, under the construction manager at risk, a guaranteed maximum price for the school district. There's even a different approach that can be used. Typically, school districts operate under uh, section 49 of the Tennessee Code Annotated. Tennessee Code Annotated also under section uh, 12 provides something called the Public Building Authority, which gives, gives even a different option for building buildings. So there's different delivery methods can be used when building a building. And when you're building a building, it will involve a lot of professionals. There'll be professionals that'll be used for the design of the building. You have architects, engineers, and consultants that will all be involved in the design. And with the design, there are several different phases. You begin in design with a programming phase, and then you move to schematic design, design development, construction documents, and then finally, as the building's being built, construction administration. Again, it's important to involve uh, lots of people in these different phases. It's in, important to involve stakeholders. It's important to involve uh, the obviously funding bodies. It's important to involve school administrators and school personnel in going through the design of a building. And then once the building has been designed and construction begins, you're dealing with contractors, subcontractors, There'll be owner's representative who's actually working with the contractors. And there's lots of phases through the construction. You begin with site work, then a foundation, then you're doing the structure. You're dealing with the building envelope, mechanical and plumbing, electrical specialties, interiors. Then you'll punch and clean the building. And if you've ever been involved in a building process, you need to know what it means to punch the building or create a punch list of items that need to be dealt with. 
and then you'll have inspections. So all of that, there's a lot that goes into uh, building a new facility, building a replacement facility, or building addition to an existing facility. And then even uh, you move on from that, from just the construction, obviously with a new facility, you're dealing with something called furnitures, fixtures, and equipment. So you're looking at furniture for the building, you're putting technology, most of the time with the school district, putting technology that will include the technology infrastructure, the network that goes in the building. Uh, most buildings now are adding wireless access points. So the buildings are not just wired for technology, they have wireless technology within the building. And then also uh, there's equipment that would be put in there as part of that. There are other maintenance items that have to be dealt with that we really hadn't covered and kind of throw these together all at the end and kind of a catch all. Signage, we mentioned the importance of signage uh, earlier, but there's all kinds of different signage that needs to go into a building. Room identification, you've got a sign that has each room numbered, maybe each room labeled as what class is in that room. Uh, there's signage that shows means of egress. There's directional signs that help people find their way. Some of our school facilities are very large buildings, so you need directional signage to say what's down this hallway or what's down that hallway. There will be a building map usually a sign inside a building that will have a building map so people can find their way. And the signage doesn't just in, uh, be included inside the building, but it's important on the outside. Signage in the parking lot, signage directing visitors to the office, signage pointing out where delivery should be made. Uh, signage is an important part of a facility. Also with the facility, you have the road and the parking areas. So there's paving to be dealt with. It has to be maintained. It doesn't last forever. Uh, school uh, parking lots have to be repaved. There's ceiling that goes along with that, striping that goes along with that. A lot of schools utilize numbers or labels on their parking places. Uh, obviously, some of the parking places have to be ADA uh, compliant and labeled as well. And then there's signage that goes along with roads and parking areas. Uh, there's you know traffic control signage. Then there's directional signage. Then there's parking uh, signage that you'll have in the parking lot. Other areas are ground maintenance. Uh, that includes grass mowing, landscaping, irrigation, pruning, pruning, trimming trees and shrubs, insect control, weed control. Uh, sometimes that is outsourced. Sometimes that's handled in-house. Um, uh, also with grounds maintenance, though, you need to understand, just like we talked about with cleaning and with maintenance of the facility, there are different levels. And so expectations should be set. And again, APA puts together a matrix for grounds magnets. And you can see, again, those same different levels going from one at the highest and five to the lowest. And most school districts, K-12 school districts, operating in the two to the three level. Uh, some even maybe drop down into three to the four, though probably to, uh, somewhere around the two to three is where most school districts operates for grounds care. But in addition to uh, the grounds of the school, you also have athletic fields. Some school districts manage those separately. They'll have one crew to take care of grounds and another crew. Sometimes it's even designate, uh, uh, delegated to the athletic staff to take care of athletic fields. And of course, with taking care of athletic fields, you have mowing. Most of those are irrigated. There's striping of those fields, numbering of those fields. But in addition to that, with the athletic fields, you have lighting, you have grandstands and bleachers, concession stands, restrooms, field houses. These are all items that have to be maintained as a part of the school facility. There are other maintenance uh, items that sometimes we don't think about, but which are very important, and that's the management and disposal of hazardous materials. We do have hazardous materials within our schools. The first of those are chemicals and cleaning solutions. We, for chemicals and cleaning solutions, there must be maintained safety data sheets. They have to be on file at the facility for any chemicals that are used within that facility. The safety data sheets used to be known as MSDS sheets. They're now known as safety data. Of course, these are monitored by OSHA, Occupational Safety and Health Group, um, and um, this applies primarily within a school. The chemicals that you will find will either be the cleaning solutions or in the chemistry labs. There are actually proper ways that those must be disposed of. You can't just throw those in the trash. So it's important that you are uh, managing and disposing of any chemicals or cleaning solutions 
in the proper way. We've listed some websites here that give some good information about that. Uh, but again, for most school districts, if you're gonna be disposing of any chemicals or cleaning solutions, you need to be utilizing your maintenance department or whichever staff is designated to deal with those in the way that they're supposed to be done. Other uh, waste that has to be so disposed of is electronic waste, computer equipment, peripherals, batteries, light bulbs. Again, here's a helpful website for that. And again, these must be disposed of properly. They cannot be put in a trash dumpster. You can't put a, a computer equipment or monitors or TVs or batteries or light bulbs into the dumpster. They have to be disposed of properly. Um, Another item that we deal with in schools and we specifically uh, have regulations on is asbestos. There are many of our buildings uh, because of the time they were built uh, before the mid 80s. Most buildings were built with some form of asbestos. Some of that is in floor tile. Some of it's in uh, glazing on windows or caulking on windows. Some of it's in spray on applications on ceilings. But uh, in Tennessee, we're required to file all of that through, with the State Department of Education. There has to be designated people within school district to monitor that. Asbestos is only a problem if it's disturbed, if it becomes, uh, the term is friable, if it becomes a substance that can, can, can become airborne. So there it's, asbestos does not have to be removed from building. It just, rebuild it, buildings, it just has to be managed. And if it is removed, it has to be removed using the proper personnel in the proper situations. Uh, you have to call in professionals and then there has to be tests done to make sure that the air is cleared after the asbestos is removed. A new regulation in Tennessee in 2019 is we now have to test our schools for drinking water, tests for lead in drinking water. Um, uh, the, uh, Regulations on this have come out just a little bit fuzzy. Schools were required to have a plan in place by January 1st, but it, the, the regulations have not been real specific on when that testing has to begin, gun, uh, when the testing has to begin, but also it does require that the testing has to be done every two years. And we are gonna have to test all of the drinking water within our schools for lead. And then there's, if they, there's lead levels found, then there's responses that have to be made. And of course, one of the other things that we deal with in schools from time to time is mold. And mold primarily has to do with, uh, with improper airflow or improper moisture management in schools uh, and can result in that. And there's proper remediation that must take place if, lead, if mold is found within the schools. Other maintenance items that we deal with is energy management. It's a big part of the managing a facility is uh, managing the energy that's used in that facility. There's a lot of things that are put in place to help do with that. We've mentioned building automation systems already. They help us do thermostat set points and setbacks when we're uh, setting for occupied or unoccupied times. Occupancy sensors, sometimes especially lighting in, uh, in our buildings now is controlled by occupancy sensors. Uh, you have computer power management, vending misers, actually that shut down vending machines when they're not being used, automatic and low flow flush valves and faucets or aerators on faucets, small appliance limitations. A lot of school districts have put limitations on putting small appliances uh, in classrooms or in parts of the building. And obviously it's, it's a behavior change sometimes too in actually accomplishing energy management. Uh, pest management is another part of a managing a facility. Sometimes you're looking at pest control versus pest management and only licensed individuals or those under their direct supervision can apply pesticides in schools, cafeterias. It's real important for school personnel to realize that you can't be spraying in schools for insects. That can only be done. That's uh, TCA 62-21-124, which regulates that. Here's some helpful websites that gives you this information. Now, I know we've gone through a lot of things, but this is really just a brief overview and shows why that K-12 school districts have dedicated personnel to take care of the operation and maintenance of their facilities. Uh, our role, because that's, that's part of my role and, and the things that I handle with our school district, is to support administrators 
and educators and making sure that their schools are as functional, that they meet the needs, that they offer a safe environment, they offer a comfortable environment, they offer a clean environment, and they assist with helping the real goal of schools, and that's to help students learn.